You're listening to Podhaven. Close enough. <laughs> it's didn't it didn't work with that. Should be a five second. I've I've like... missed this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I haven't recorded any podcast for months. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, um, it's gonna be. We take a little bit to get into the swing of this here, but uh, I'm Martin Bryson. This is the Haven. It's a new actual play D and D podcast, fifth edition podcast. For uh, the uh, Podhaven family of podcasts, there'll probably be a little jingle we'll stick in here somewhere, just so you know where you are. And uh, it's going to be about, uh, primarily about storytelling and having fun with some friends. So let's uh, get into it. It's going to be a little introductory session. There won't be much actual role playing at this point. Um, but just so we can introduce the world, introduce the concepts, and all get to know each other's characters and talk a little bit about some of the fine details here. So... Uh, who uh, who wants to talk about their characters first? Anyone? Any volunteers? Go okay. on, man. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> go, go, go. It's a good start. Do we to go first? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. introduce yourself, then uh, introduce your character and give us a little bit of background detail about them. Hello, my name's uh, Martin, uh, Martin Doherty, and I'm playing a character called Krebs Daintly. Um, he is a hobgoblin artificer. I said hobgoblin. Not Goblin. There we are. He's got a criminal background. Uh, he's neutral evil. Um, uh, I'm just, okay. reading from, just reading from the list. And uh, who's next? Uh, I guess we'll do uh, Gavel since you kind yeah. of jumped in there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Gavel Chipilevsky. Uh I uh, I'll be pre- playing as Pry, the Orc Bard. Uh, basically, uh, I'm just uh, Pry is going on an adventure to find material to write heroic songs uh, to sing them to the populace and make everybody more excited about everything. That sounds cool. All right. um, So we don't talk over each other. I'll just pick someone. Uh, Helen, how about you? Yes. Hello. I'm Helen. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to play a uh, true neutral uh, warlock. Uh, Her name is Aistla and he has the haunted one uh, background. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how about uh, Amelia? How yeah. About you? Hi, Amelia here. Uh, my character is called Mimosa Gwenwen. Or, well, yeah. And <coughs> she's a noble monk. Well, mechanically monk. Oh. <laughs> Character-wise, not very, very good, monk-like. Very I don't think. And her... I do love this character concept. I'm kind of looking forward to getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> and her alignment is an alignment. Okay. An alignment. Okay. That's ambiguous. <laughs> yes. She's aligned. Very good. Yeah. It's always fun when it's ambiguous like that. Uh, okay, I guess that just leaves Heath. So, Tell us a little bit about you. I am Heath Wong. I'm going to be playing Graham Shiordo. That's Shiordo spelled with an X. Uh, the human... Paladin, neutral, good alignment with the Acolyte background. Essentially, I, I am a anti-theistic, depressed Paladin with a fatalistic sense of humor. Okay, good. Uh, this is a brief introduction to everyone. Uh, I, as I said before, I'm Martin Bryson, I'm the DM here. Uh, the way that I like to play these games is, is it's a lot based on character interactions and improvisation. So I have the basic sketch for the world. Uh, written up for the most part and I leave a lot of room for uh, collaborative storytelling and for things to kind of arise organically from the narrative that I've structured. So to get everyone started, um, we are we open on uh, the land of Alba which is a not quite an island nation per se but it does feel like one. It's um, it's a small nation with a total population equivalent to a large city in more developed parts of the world more civilized. Well, yeah, you could say civilized in heavy scare quotes. 
Um, right. A cold, rugged climate that makes it unappealing to most traders, travellers and tourists. It is uh, divided into two broad regions. There's the cold, rocky northern highlands and the relatively warm, verdant south southern lowlands. Oceans stretch off to the horizon to the north, east and west as far as the eye can see, though the northern and northwestern coasts are dotted with uh, islands scattered here and there of uh, varying sizes and utility. Um, some of them are a little bit, more, little more than just like rocky outposts with names that jut out of the sea. Others are actually large enough to hold small, self-sufficient villages. But uh, no more than that. Uh, the mainland is where most of the people live. Uh, as for the Northern Highlands, uh, very few people actually live there, relatively. Uh, it's the, it takes up about two-thirds of the country's total mass. And it's... Uh, the least densely populated part of the entire place. Um, the land is too uneven for most building and too rocky for farming much beyond a subsistence level. It's uh, home primarily to cotters and crofters, which are uh, itinerant farmers who eke out a living in the tough soil there. Clan loyal military battalions taking advantage of the high land to build forts, fuel paranoia and engage in petty skirmishes. Religious organisations are there to either preach to the hard-loving locals or for more specific religious questing, often for uh, artefacts or evidence of their gods, which we'll get into a little bit later. And archaeologists to spend their lives searching for artefacts of, the, of those old gods, for fame, fortune and, occasionally, academic interest. Scattered amongst them are bandits, smugglers, wizards who need privacy for their <laughs> experiments, and mercenaries who see profit in protecting travellers from the dangers presented by the other three. The southern border has been closed by Alba's neighbouring nation, Kos, for many years, fed by belief that Alba is little more than a land of bandits and mercenaries that could raid and pillage towns in Kos's northern regions. Traders and adventurers with approved guild licences, academics with special invitations and curious noble tourists leveraging their connections to get exceptions to the rules are the most common people seen crossing the border into Alba these days. Very few people from Alba are seen crossing the other way. There is ample work for adventurers all over Alba, though they lack the formal guild structure familiar to those from Kos. What organisations do exist tend to be loose and ad hoc, usually formed to deal with one specific problem before disbanding. There are two adventurers organisations uh, that do exist and, uh, and are more well established and more permanent. The Knights of the Rose Garden are an exclusive group of noble-born adventurers formed centuries ago, or so they claim, by one of Alba's major universities to protect and ex execute their research interests, which can be uh, a little brutal from time to time. And the Burn Folk, a small group based on the southern border that typically sell their services as guards, scouts and guides for Cossian people travelling in the highlands. Both of these are small and specialised, so rarely compete with the more common independent adventurers, but protect their interests aggressively if they're forced to so you may at least initially want to stay clear of those two unless you have something to offer them. For independent adventurers like yourselves, uh, escorting, guarding, scouting, bounty hunting, artifact retrieval and participating in Highland clan skirmishes are already all steady sources of income. For those who prefer the other side of the law, of course, there are always ample opportunities for banditry and smuggling if you have the stomach for it. Recent technological developments have begun to change things in Alba's largest settlements. The universities based there have collaborated on new magical research avenues that have led to the development of new lighting and tools, among other things. There are excited whispers among academics and those working with them about the potential of these new technologies, but so far little is known by the public at large. Beasts, monstrous beings and highwaymen are part of life in Alba, especially in the more rural areas, and the relative development in the lowlands has done little so far to curb this outside of major settlements. Forests and isolated mountainous areas are particularly dangerous and this has slowed and in some cases totally prevented the growth of settlements and farms in those places. Some have managed to maintain small, unstable settlements there, but always do so by reaching an understanding by, with the local criminal elements or less, uh, again heavy scare quotes, civilised threats, usually in the form of a cut of their income and lasting only as long as is convenient. All of this is widely known to the people of Alba and very quickly and easily learned by people who travel there for the first time. So that gives us a little bit of a grounding on the area and what it's like here. It's a, it's a rough place. It's a, it's, a, it's a place with a lot of difficult living, but it is, not, um, it is not the wild badlands it's sometimes made out to be by its neighbours to the south. One thing you have to know about Alba is that the gods are dead. Or so it's believed. Centuries before, long before anyone, well, almost anyone alive remembers, the gods were believed to have engaged in a civil war. 
The gods in this land were tangible beings, physical things, like creatures you could touch and see and talk to. But there was a cataclysm of sorts. Again, this is what the stories tell. The actual living memory is much more scattered and un, in, uh, uh, incohate. But there was believed to have been a civil war among the gods that ultimately led to the destruction of every one of them. They all disappeared without warning. Now, in Alba, the major religions used to hold a lot of political power, a lot of sway, a lot of followers, a lot of wealth, and even military strength in some cases. They would often engage in uh, petty political squabbles and battles all over the place. They were effectively uh, a, a de facto government, uh, which constantly fought with itself and sometimes engaged in open civil war. After the gods disappeared, this changed. The people of Alba lost faith in their churches, in their institutions, in their religious traditions, and by and large, they moved on. <coughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm calling it. The gods just, uh, Dan, t t just told everybody they're having a punch up that made them die. But t t honestly, they just s decided to fuck off and be done with like uh, mortals and their own holiday yeah. now. Well, that's one possibility. Like no one really knows for sure. Like anyone who was alive then has a very scattered and unclear picture of what actually happened. Now we'll learn more about the nature of these gods as we go on, um, and the the more name I, I deliberately kept the names of the cities and the gods a little vague, a little mysterious, because I think it's more interesting to uncover that as we play. Because most of you will be new, but to, to Alba, but those of you that aren't, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that in game there. Uh, so, given that baseline, um, why don't we go around everyone's character again and talk a little bit about why you're in Alba, what your place is there, and what you intend to do with your life there. So let's, because we ended with Heath last time, let's start with Heath this time. So yes, let's talk a little bit more about Graham. What did, what, what's, uh, what's Graham's uh, kind of place here? So Graham, as we've discussed off mic, um, is originally from one of these uh, I don't know if specifically if, you, if it was one of the temples that you mentioned there that managed to hold on. I think that would make sense. Yeah. Um, to, to be clear, by the way, on the recording here, um, this is something we're we're still kind of a, it's still a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, that some of the details won't be entirely nailed down yet. So this is going to be part of the kind of process of building this. Uh, yeah. So I think it would make sense if maybe maybe part of that same tradition would that be something you'd be happy yeah, with? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, okay, so what I'll do is, off mic a little later on, I'll talk over some of the details with you of the specifics of that god, and we could come across it kind of more organically in the story. Sounds good to me. Yeah. But yeah, tell us a little bit about what, 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 what fed Graham's desire to kind of be... So, for the last several centuries, because he was a member of not only the people who... His family was um, not only among the people who kind of... Kept, maintained this church and tried to keep its services operational and keep it from just falling into you know poverty and disrepair but there's also i think at least a, a branch of them that also, that served as sort of temple guards who underwent a lot of martial arts and possibly mystical training and prep um, mostly as tradition at this point but nominally with um, in preparation for some sort of holy war that they expected to happen when their god returned and brought them to glory um, and I think Graham, throughout his childhood, increasingly saw this all as a colossal fucking waste of time. Because from his perspective, it seemed obvious that the gods were dead or gone and having abandoned mortals and were never coming back and did not deserve for whole generations of people to work themselves away and waste their lives in service to them. And so, to the tremendous disapproval and disappointment of his family, he left that order of people and ventured out into the world, trying to, hoping to, I think, to put some of his, um, the, ide the ideologies that had been preached to him to actual practice, rather than them just being kept within the walls of a congregation, and also trying to put his, some of his training to an actual, a positive use. So would you say he's more of a more of a kind of get out there help the poor type or more of a protect the innocent kind of type? Um, I'm not sure he even knows yet because he is really, he's searching for a purpose in life. But I I would imagine that he left the order not too long ago, maybe like maybe a few months ago. 
Right. So it's a fairly new. It's fairly new out here. Yeah. He's still kind of learning the ropes a little bit. He grew up cloistered and yeah. isn't. It's kind of naive about the world yeah. outside of his cloister. It, it wasn't so much. There's this one specific task I'm going to set out and point myself to. It was more. I just can't stay here. So I'm just going to leave and try to figure it out from there. Mm. Do you think he may be interested in leaving Alba? Potentially, yes. Um, I don't think he's yeah. ever. Really That's something I, I did. I did. Yeah. Sorry, I let you finish. Uh, I, I don't think it because he, he's obviously never seen anything outside of Alba. He's, I think he had. I'm not sure he'd ever even really been outside of his um, city before. So I, I think um, venturing beyond the confines of that continent is something that would probably be exciting, but kind of terrifying. Yeah. Okay. That's a really interesting thing because, for me, uh, the way I envision Alba is that it's a it's quite an isolated place, partly by design and partly by an accident of geography. It's not easy to get in and out of there right now. Um, and but there are plenty of people there who do badly want to leave, just as many it's just as there are as many people who want to stay forever. Uh, it is, as I said, for many people in Alba, life is difficult. Um, but it is all it also has its own kind of unique rewards that. A lot of people really value so i find that a really interesting dynamic for a character that's unclear if they want to stay or if they want to leave or if this is going to be enough for them i think that's a really interesting thing for us to explore yeah um okay yeah so let's work back up the line here let's talk to emilia tell us a little bit more about uh, mimosa yeah so <clears throat> mimosa is in alba largely because her sister chardonnay Upstage her. <laughs> God, <laughs> God. <laughs> God. Oh, God damn it! Is that is that going to be a theme through the whole family? Oh, and my my, ne- my nephew has arrived, Mojito. <laughs> <laughs> is anybody in there called Appletini? <laughs> uh, I'd like to change. I'd like to change my character name to Appletini. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, um, my sister Chardonnay upstaged me at the debutante ball by oh, performing actual magic. Like a commoner wizard. And it totally upstaged me. I, I can't... <laughs> I can't not believe her nerve. And now I have to go someplace far away where no one knows who I am, so I can train to... So I can train properly and without anyone knowing who the hell I am. Although, uh, yeah, I've seen the problems with that too, because good God, room service sucks here. But... One day, I will go back to Kossu and I will demonstrate to my father, my mother, and my goddamn sister that I deserve to lead House Gwynwyn to glory. So what I'm picturing right now um, is that you're basically Tahani from The Good Place if she never went good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually really good. exactly what... I've been busy her on. <laughs> well, her and a couple of other characters, but yeah, to Hani Mersfall. Yeah, that's that's really good. I like that. I'm just going to be constantly name dropping other people, and that they all just have names <laughs> and other drinks. And nobody knows who you're talking about. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's going to be so good. Um, okay, <laughs> so what, what's um what is kind of Mimosa's situation right now? Is uh is she is she just arrived in Alba? And still trying to figure it out. Has she been here a while and thoroughly miserable? I'd say she's been here for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, right. Does she know why that... she's here? Does she know what she's doing here? Or does she just kind of do it on a whim? Yeah, she mostly came to Alba on a whim. Like... But, like, once she got there, it... It dawned on her that once she'd spent all of her money on soap park goods, it was actually <laughs> quite difficult to get 
back out, even though, you know, mm -hmm. even though she's, she is She's discovered she something is. a lot of Cossians do uh, after they come here out of curiosity. Yeah. That it's not quite as easy to get back out as it was to get in. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, actually, I think because we talked about this, and I really like this idea, talk a little bit about how you're envisioning the monk concept for your character. Oh, yeah. So, the idea is, is that, well, I thought back to, like, what I've read of nobility and especially, like, bourgeoisie life, and mm -hmm. one of the things was that... There were clubs where the sort of the requirement for entry was that you would show them a finished journal, which demonstrated that you had the time to waste on writing a journal for hours a day. So, <clears throat> what if we took that? and applied it to a fantasy world and so the idea is is that the costume nobles constantly train uh, martial arts for the express purpose of demonstrating how much time they can waste on it <laughs> and so they basically train in the four elements uh sun soul and the astral self because those are the flashiest and <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to demonstrate your skill in <coughs> a practice that is supposed to be about self-improvement if it's actually like really glamorous and fanciful and it makes for a good show we all private friends at some lodge you've bought for the weekend <laughs> brilliant yeah i think the way i the way i talked about it before off off mic is that uh it's kind of like an expensive yoga class but with magic <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, okay, Helen, tell us a little bit about your character. I've forgotten their name, sorry. Okay, <laughs> well, it's Aisla, and I also just actually Aisla, added his last name funny. finally. So yeah, so it's Aisla so, Brennan now. Aisla is a character we're bringing over from another campaign we did. Um, sort of, yeah. I remember. Yeah, well, kind of uh, adapted yeah. a little bit. Yeah, so like originally she was just kind of like some magnificent doomsday cult thing. Uh, but yeah, I kind of just... Yeah, more for like, but more for like one shot. So I kind of made her more open for development and the like. So she's mostly just she's a haunted one, and that basically means that she's haunted by some terrible happening in her past. Uh, it's and the, this it's the edgiest of backgrounds. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, oh, the haunted one. That, that that sounds good. Oh wait, this is just the. Uh, edgy loner character background. Let's take it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So are you fantasy Batman? Uh, no, no, no. But it's absolutely the background for fantasy Batman. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, something terrible happened in your past. People can see on you that you've seen some shit. So they are gonna help you out out of sheer, like, wanting to help out some poor soul who is dealing with some shit. And <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I absolutely recommend just looking up Haunted One. Uh, yeah, as can I the read the feature? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's called Heart of Darkness. Those who look into your eyes can see that you have faced unimaginable horror and that you are no stranger to the darkness. But though they might fear you, commoners will extend you every courtesy and do their utmost to help you. Unless you have shown yourself to be a danger to them, they will even take up arms to fight alongside you, should you find yourself facing an enemy alone. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> so it's the, folk hero, but right. edgy. Yeah, I love yeah. it. 
It's, it, I love it because it, it kind of implies that they see you and you're like, oh no, I have to protect this sweet innocent child. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my case, that might actually be kind of the actual idea. I'm, I'm not sure that's actually like the intended. Uh, I feel it's more like um, this one knows what they're talking about when it comes to like the dark side of the world. So you should probably help them out. Yep. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. I, I really, I really like that. Um, yeah, is there anything it's... you wanted to talk about your class specifically? Any kind of uh, are so, you using uh, any like UE features or anything like that? So Aisla is a warlock of a great old one, uh, and she ha and she's a human. Uh, she's an alternate human, so I picked yeah. up the alert feat, uh, and which basically gives me shit ton of in initiative. <laughs> <laughs> and like, uh, and um, also... to, clarify, to clarify, by the way, just uh, for the for the for the folks at home, um, we are not using the standard. Uh, I guess I think it's the main setting right now is Faerun, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, yeah, everyone's just come out, but yeah, that's the... yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're we're not using any any of the uh, the standard cosmologies here. I have, as I mentioned before, I have my own series of gods that I'm constructing at the moment. It's it's part way done. We actually have one already settled in for Aisla. Yep. Um, and I and if you want, I can read a brief description of that when you're done here, just so we we'll give you a little background on it. I'm still developing the god for Graham, and we'll work on that a little later. So Aisla, basically, uh, she saw a vision of that old fight between the gods in like one of her dreams, and she had some sort of special connection with the uh, uh, with Ersk, which is some kind of which is kind of the. Uh, dangerous serpent of sorts that is kind of big in this whole event. Uh, and she kind of got some kind of connection with that serpent. And um, when she woke up from that dream, uh, her entire little, like, uh, village, like, little farming community was basically destroyed or gone or something. Like, it's it's like it's, it had been abandoned for, like, years all the people who were lived there were still there, they're just dead. And that's basically why she's the haunted one, because now she's being followed by some shadowy figure that only Oh she yes, can and see. there was a, a ring, wasn't there too, that you... Yeah, uh, you and, and uh, she also woke up with a bracelet in the shape of like a snake biting its own tail that she can't get off, and that has a bit of a glow to her, to it, mm -hmm. uh, eyes. Washing your okay. wrists is... A chore, I take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does it? Do, do you get a little sticky under there? A little gross? Is there? Is there oh. a smell? <laughs> this... What? To to, I... to 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 it, It's actually kind of a a backdoor Taz reference. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. But while we're on that topic, let's talk a little bit about one of the two old gods that I do have definitively nailed down right now. This is Ersk Anglian Doirech. Uh, sorry, this pronunciation is bad. Ang Anglian Dorainiech. Uh, that's uh, Gaelic for Ersk, the Devouring Valley. Ersk was once a common feature in myths and religious ceremonies all over Alba. It is typically depicted as an enormous snake, often rising from deep in the earth or surrounding the entire land of Alba itself. It lived underground and usually served an antagonistic role in myths of the time, tricking and sometimes even devouring the other gods. It was also believed to bring apocalyptic nightmares to those on the surface, whether these served as warnings or just cruel sport was often ambiguous. What worshippers of es Ersk existed often did so out of fear and hope that worship would appease the beast for a while. It was particularly feared by the dwarves of Alba, who believed that it moved through the earth constantly searching for a way to the surface, whereupon it would devour all living things. A dwarven settlement built into an island formed from an, volcanic, an ancient volcanic cap actually began as a temple dedicated to Ersk. The clerics there believed that the island was where Ersk would one day rise and, and held vigil over it to delay that event as much as possible. After the gods vanished, this purpose was forgotten and the clerics died out, the temple became a trading hub and then eventually grew into a town. This island that I mentioned is actually based on a real place. Uh... <sighs> I can't remember the name of it now, but it is just off the coast of a place I grew up. So I just kind of had that you, in mind as I was writing it. You have essentially created fantasy Scotland. I, I did appreciate yeah. that one. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's it's not a one to one thing, but yeah, it's 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 heavily inspired. It's fantasy sure. Scotland. Um, There's highlands that people are scared of and that no one likes each other. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's Scotland. basically yeah. That does describe it pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> it's based on an island. If, if anyone's interested, it's based on an island called Ilza Craig. 
which is a uh, which is a volcanic cap uh, formed from centuries old, uh, millennia old, really. So yeah, a um, little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, trivia for you there. Uh, who's up next? Uh, that would be, I guess, Gavel. I guess you're up next. Talk a little bit more about your character. Yeah. So, uh, Pry is uh, well. Uh, Pry was born into a family uh, with a tradition of, I would say, ass kicking. <laughs> like, uh, like uh, his parents, his twin sister Joe, uh, their assorted uncles, grandmas, uh, aunts, uh, grandmas, uncles, what, who have you, uh, have been like uh, military, like like traditionally military personnel, mercenaries, renowned hunters. Famed martial artists, you know, what have you. Most notably, uh, a para- uh, and those most notably, currently, Joe is a uh, very sought-after mercenary with uh, a very, very uh, like per- a lot of personal fame. And uh, Pry was never really about that. Pry was more uh, like he loved talking to people about the things his family does like he loved bigging people up and he tended to uh, exaggerated what were already amazing things that these people have done I find, I find Pry very charming I have to say <laughs> Pry sounds like a good boy and, and he like he, he went uh, he basically uh, like he decided he wants to like go out into the world and like make uh, let's say a library of stuff he, he like he went through not to you know live off family fame and he kind of like he he wants to you know he wants to do good by by the family like look i've done like i've been to these awesome things then they, they participated in these awesome events and like i i'm like uh i'm uh Enriching people's lives with this, uh, uh, all of this entertainment and showmanship, and look, uh, look, this is all so awesome. So, uh, and he he's from Kosia, Kos, Kos, yeah, Kos. So he's from Kos, and like he didn't really know how much, uh, like he like he didn't really know how much of the uh, stuff that's going on about Alba was true or not, but he was like. There's at least some like strife there, and people are probably badass or, uh, mostly, and they have this this uh, scary north. So probably something happens there. So he decided to go there, and uh, the problem is like he, he like you've mentioned that the border control is mostly mm-hmm. very strict between Kos and Alba. Yeah. And he just kind of stumbled through. <laughs> I should and... say that this is this is uh, something I actually. But before you even brought this up, this is something I thought about, and I did uh, kind of, I think, come to the conclusion that it would be more interesting if it was stricter one way than the other. It's easier to get in than to get back out. It's it's still challenging in a lot of ways, but it's 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 definitely easier for sure. Like if if you are determined enough, you can probably find a way in. You're gonna have a much harder time getting back out. Yeah, basically what happened is like Pry got uh, chatting with some some uh, bodyguards of some caravan going into Alba, and he looked like he belonged. Someone did a wrong head count, and uh, three days later, Pry noticed he's not in Kos anymore. Three days. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Look, three he's days. he he's very distractible. <laughs> Evidently, <laughs> and like, Prey has a very, very one very decided weakness of a definite lack of good judgment, and he will, uh, he Prey will be amazed at how, at how exciting or cool something is when it's a direct, the even and probably mainly when it's a direct danger to his life. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> it's like that dragon is breathing fire at us. 
<laughs> Time to write a limerick about it. <laughs> and basically, I'm like, I'm like, I have mechanically, I, like, I'm a bard with the entertainment uh, entertainer background. I mean, chaotic good and. Uh, like the only notable thing that you can't really find, like that you can't pick up from the ba base game, is like I picked up a spell called the Unearthly Chorus from Unearthed Arcana, which is basically in a thirty f within thirty feet around me, I can make music play. <laughs> Just I'm a literal one man band at this point. I'm into that. That's really cool. And, uh, <laughs> I'm also kind of looking forward at this point, uh, after, after, after Emilia talked about Mimosa, I'm looking, uh, uh, looking forward to uh, how uh, our experiences with family clash, <laughs> yeah. because we both have this really larger than, like, like really impressive, w f apparently famous sister. <laughs> well, I wouldn't I'm, say I'm looking... she's famous? Any more okay. than me? But. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone else might say that, but you certainly would. No, no, no. Maybe influential, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> certainly not more famous. <laughs> and I was, and I was also trying to be subtle about the uh, uh, about the pun in their names. So you guys oh. probably missed it. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. What? What's the what's the pun? Well, uh, my name is Pry, and I have a twin sister whose name is Joe. Nope. <laughs> We're our parents, Pride and Joy. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, that's good. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, that was, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. Um, I guess that just leaves Martin. Mm. All right, uh, my name's uh, Krebs Dately. Krebs Dately. I'm a <laughs> hob, hob, hobgoblin artificer, um, which means I make things. It's a new class released with the Eberron Rise of War. I think <laughs> I, I, I dropped the, uh, the accent there because I'm talking now about D&D books. That's not something a hobgoblin would be. But yeah, <laughs> hobgoblin, which is normally a monstrous race, but um, in Roland's Guide to Monsters, they released some cool like um, player character st stats for them. So... I've got um, some cool features with that. Uh, he's a neutral evil um, smuggler of spe specifically of magic weapons and items that aren't necessarily legal in whatever city he's from. Which I, I'm not quite sure how the cities tend to work in. This we'll, we'll nail that down later. Down. I'm, I want to introduce them kind right. of a lot more yes, organically then, in the event. Um, so we'll, we'll introduce it as we talk about it, and I'll tell yeah. you a bit about what you need to know in advance. So from that, he's got the criminal background, which I chose specifically because of one of the personality traits that was uh, on option. Normally I don't like the stuff in the player's handbook for this, but in terms of uh, flaws, there is one um, for the criminal which says, an innocent person is in prison for a crime that I committed, full stop. I'm okay with that, <laughs> full stop, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, uh, I also got a criminal contact, which we'll uh, talk about a bit after that, um, which will be quite useful. Um, I think, the way um, that the neutral evil kind of manifests in this character is, is a, not dislike, but kind of an apathy towards people who aren't his friends or family. And um, alongside that, though, the, the criminal um, criminal side, breaking various, as many laws as there possibly is in this city um, that he's from. And yeah, that's kind of the whole deal. In terms of, uh, to give you some insight, because I've, uh, I've quite a drawing, I've drawn a little mood board. And I've um, essentially I've got some ridiculous things like some uh, a wand with a scope. Um, I've drawn a a bag full of crystals, a lot of cogs with faces on, um, and I, I tried to copy the hobgoblin that's on um, it's in one of the D and D books. But I end up drawing and making him look a bit like Justin Timberlake, circa M C. <laughs> quite the idea, considering he's got he's got a minus two charisma, but. Um, <laughs> Well, 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 so he's well, not bringing sexy back anytime soon. Uh, he's he's really not bringing sexy back. He's really not, unless it's illegal and he can make money from it. He's not bringing <laughs> anything sexy back. Um, but yeah, I, I want to choose the artificer because it's a brand new. It's the first new class that's been officially released since Five E came out, and it's got some really cool little things in. Like um, you can 
make uh, level one it doesn't really have that much but on later levels you get some really cool stuff with them um, yeah and i think that's sort of yeah what i have planned out at the minute um i want to kind of evolve it a bit more as, as we talked and played maybe mm -hmm. would be ideal yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, this the part of the purpose of this episode is to kind of nail down some of the, uh, yeah. the kind of fine details together. Kind of as as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I want this to be in part a little bit collaborative. Yes. You know, I, I want to get some of your input and some of the organic uh, things that come up during the course of telling the story to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, because even for people who lived and grew up in Alba, it's a very mysterious place. There's a lot that yeah. isn't known. There isn't much recorded history. There's an entire religious organization whose job is to archive recorded history, but they're the only people doing it. And they've lost a lot of money and influence, as I mentioned, in the past centuries. And as a result, a lot of their records are also gone. So much of the recorded history of Alba is not known to most people. I want to use this kind of blank space to fill in something more interesting than I could come up with by myself. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have a framework, I'll have the, you know, the contemporary world of Alba, what it's like now for the people living there, the kind of things everyone would know. And we can fill out the rest as we go. I have ideas, but I want, to, I want us all to kind of guide this and work together on making it kind of much more interesting, much more personal to us. Because that's part of my mission in, in doing this, I think. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I guess a couple of details about how I, the kind of the tone and feel of the game. Um, I we're all pretty familiar with the rules of fifth edition by this point. We've all been playing together for a while, um, and for those of us that haven't played together that much, we we do still know the game fairly well. So um, there will, we will be will not strictly adhering to the rules. There will, there won't be a level of discomfort learning them that we often get with 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 the actual play podcast sometimes. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with how it works, so we'll all know how to blend these or naturally into gameplay. Uh, a little bit about my DMing style. Um, I don't like doing things like uh, railroading players very much, but I also don't like dithering, so I, I use tech storytelling techniques to keep things moving a lot of the time. So you might find me like occasionally interrupting conversations with events or interrupting things that I feel are, are dragging on or taking too long. Especially for a podcast format, uh, you, you don't want to lose narrative steam all the time. So I think that's it's, it's something that you, you might find that you may, may come up a few times. There will be some homebrewing of the rules from time to time, but it will be fairly minimal because I want everyone who's playing and listening to feel like they can, can at least connect to a baseline of the story and then I can work with that. I don't want to be entirely introduced into a totally new game or a totally new concept. You know, the, the, the basic fantasy species are the same. The way the magic is basically the same. Uh, on a, a, note, a note on that, though, divine magic is different a little bit. Because in Alba, the gods are gone and no one can communicate with them or contact them in any way, no one really knows how divine magic works anymore. In theory, it shouldn't, but it Out does. Out of spite. <laughs> well, possibly, yeah. I mean, that, that, that is a possible theory. The two main theories on uh, between academics on Alba, depending on their religious leanings, are that the gods continue to live through their worshippers, through their clerics and their paladins, in a very tangible way. They're not dead, they're not gone, they're just decentralized. Um, decentralized godhood, I like that. Yeah, so that's what <laughs> they believe. Um, more secular-minded academics tend to think more on the lines of that divine magic is not that different from arcane magic, it's just a different form of it. And that they're tapping into it in a way that most other people can't. Uh, something about their physical or mental training of being a cleric or paladin allows them to use it in a way that other people can't do. So that, 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 that's the prevailing theory on, on secular academics. The weather conditions are generally overcast, occasionally sunny, often rainy, cold, um, generally miserable weather. We have a word for it in Scotland, we call it drich. It's what you call it when it's cold and it's raining but not so heavily that it's splashing. It's kind of, it kind of feels like it's <laughs> hanging in the air and getting under your clothes. That's oh, the we kind have, of weather. We have, yeah. that, we have that in Poland too, we call it mrawka. Yeah, that's, that's, we, we, I like that there's different words for it. That's really cool. Yep. We've, um, we, we, we've yeah. actually got one in English as well. It's just called miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just life, though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, a quick note on language. Uh, I have adapted the languages to match the kind of standard framework that, uh, that Faerun uses. So we have common, we have elvish, halfling, dwarven, etc. Uh, we also have high common, which is the dialect used in Kos. Um, and mechanically speaking, there will be different reactions from different people if you use it depending on who they are and their background. People from Kos will likely react more positively. People who are quite isolated parts of Alba, such as in the Highlands, will tend to react more negatively. Or you could also use it for role-playing purposes uh, if you're willing to get creative there. You can Speak, do some interesting speak, things with that. Speaking of that, um, you said because uh, I've got chosen a criminal background, someone who smuggles stuff yep. across the board or whatever. Yeah. Languages, because you said I should probably pick up a few more languages than I have. Yeah, I did suggest you you pick up multiple languages because you're a distributor. Uh, so yeah. What would you what would you what would you recommend? The sort of the more common. Um, ones that I would well, take. it's largely up to you. It depends on who most of your clients are. I would say I would say you should have at least three languages. Um, yeah. And the most common ones spoken on Alba are common, high common, dwarven, halfling, elven, and sylvan. Okay, I think I'll go for. Common, because common is the one that I get as standard. Um, I don't. Mm -hmm. I actually get an extra language as an artificer. Uh, oh, do you? That's no, 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 I don't. Um, never mind. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up uh, common, high common, dwarven, and gnom gnomish probably. All right, yeah, uh, Sylvan. These speak. Sylvan. The gnom gnomes here speak Sylvan. Yeah. Sylvan. Because I've connected my gnomes much more closely to their uh, their fair their, their kind of fey wild background. Yeah. Uh, so they are oh, gnomes are immortal. And oh, I should, have, I should have played a gnome. Fuck. Yeah, they don't age. And <laughs> oh, they, they can be killed. They, they can be killed. Yeah, they they, they they can't die, but they don't age. Uh, at least not in a way that I'll change. Um, I'll change my character sheet back then. <laughs> <laughs> at least not in a way that people on the material plane recognize. Um, okay. They have their own kind of ways of thinking about that. I don't think we have any gnomes in the party, so I won't really have to cover that right now. But I can get into it later. Um. Goblins, actually, I put some thought into this. Goblins, and I think this may affect the hobgoblin here because you probably will oh, yes. encounter goblins on some <laughs> level. Hobgoblins are a little different because they are uh, they consider themselves to be more civilized than your standard goblins. They make a big deal about being well-read, and at least by goblin standards. Okay. Oh, so they're, pre they're, pre they're pretentious goblins? Yeah, essentially, yeah. <laughs> uh, at least we that's how goblins. they're perceived. That may or may not be true, but that's how they're perceived. Um... Goblins have this unique way of, of naming things. They don't have names that are abstracted, like most other people. They instead use words or sounds that describe something about this, uh, the, the, this particular goblin's personality or history. And it is often like an onomatopoeic thing. Like, for example, if a goblin becomes famous for hitting itself on the head, it may be called crack, because that's the sound it makes when it hits itself on the head. Um, they also don't have written names. They have pictographic representations of their name that they carve when they need to write it down. Most of their culture is oral, uses an oral tradition. So they don't, they do have written language, but they don't use it much. It's, in, it's not very complex compared to other languages. Most of their tradition is oral. They share stories they, with each other. And they're, but their names are pictographic and they often uh, draw and carve. They're known for that. They use uh, they, they they tend to use charcoal to create art that they sell to people to, uh, when they live in cities. Uh, most goblins live in isolated places. They don't live among the others um, because they are uh, the, the, their culture kind of keeps them isolated from other people, and they have a long history of being uh, used as um, slaves and and uh, kind of cannon fodder by other like more. Uh, uh, less um, but by, by people less interested in their cultural side, so they tend to keep themselves. And now that that's mostly over, that part of the history is mostly over. They tend to keep to themselves and away from others. What ones you do can encounter in cities, as I say, tend to make livings as uh, like laborers, um, freelance artists, drawing things to sell to people. They make jewelry. They sell things like that on the streets. Yeah. Um, yeah, but their language is largely pictographic. I find that I find that, that quite that's, interesting. That, that's that's, well, that's that's very interesting because um, obviously with a name like Krebs Daintly, um, mm -hmm. I like to imagine that um, he was named uh, Daintly because um, he makes dents in things a lot when he's creating oh, yeah. his artificer. But obviously, uh, his high com, his written high com is quite poor, so he misspelled it dent as dent 
me. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Fred is the sound he makes when he sneezes, and he has. <laughs> Well, yeah, I geez. like that because it lets you choose how close to the goblin side of yourself you want to be, you know? That, that, that's quite yeah, interesting yeah. to me. And yeah, Kreb, um, Kreb, is, Kreb is the sound a hobgoblin makes when they sneeze. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the kind of thing I had in mind, so that's good. That's perfect. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of what I wanted to go into. Uh, yeah, so unless there's anybody else want to want to talk about anything while we're here? Huh? How are we covering this next time? But how do we how do we all know each other? How do we all meet? Oh yes, that's what that's something we can do right now. I was thinking of doing it next time, but I think I may actually do it now. Yeah, let's do a little bit of a how do we, how do you meet? So, I envisioned this beginning in a rural village, a few miles outside of the capital city. Uh, one of the more well-off ones, uh, not rich by any means, but but certainly not struggling economically. Um. You, the, the, the five of you are here more or less by coincidence. It's, a pop, it's an area a lot of people travel through and stop for a drink, a meal, or a warm bed mm-hmm. to get out of the, uh, the rain. So it's a, it's a particularly rainy day. Uh, the rain has been, rain, uh, has, has been pouring now for a few hours since about 6 a.m. And uh, it's the kind that soaks right through your clothes, right through your armor, right through all of your carefully oiled leather gear and gets in there no matter what you do. So you're all freezing, shivering, miserable, and you all stop together. In the, you're all in, this, in the one end in this town, quite a popular place, especially now, uh, for people traveling through there desperate to get a, a shelter from the weather. Uh, you can smell roasting meats and vegetables floating in the air as people are enjoying their hot meals. Uh, there are wet like jackets and leathers and packs just thrown around all over the place. You see beer being liberally served. Uh, a couple of people just sitting there chatting animatedly, and some shivering cold just coming in out of the uh, stamping their boots off of, uh, to get the mud off and coming in out of the cold. The five of you, how many? Did, did, just a quick uh, clarifying question: Do any of you know each other in advance, or are you all strangers? Can we, can we make a quick decision on this? Let's, let's have a think. Um, Prime might think... know Mimosa, but Mimosa won't know Pry. Okay. <laughs> do, do, does anyone want to have been smuggled into uh, Alba by um, by Krebs? <laughs> <laughs> the potential. Actually, yeah. Yeah? Okay. I believe Krebs, Graham, and... Isla are locals, right? You're 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 from yes. Isla. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm from Alba. Yeah. So Mimosa and Pry are from Kos, so they're out from outside. Yeah. yeah. Um, out in this part of the country, Mimosa, your Mimosa and Pry, your accents don't stand out like uh that much. They're, they're they're still not common, but people are used to hearing Kos accents out here, so you don't necessarily stand out that much. Um. Yeah. But as the five of you are minding your own business and uh, no 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 in, no 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 hmm? you you've already made a false assumption. We're in an establishment. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, I have this thing <laughs> called by popular demand. Right. You can always find a place to perform, usually in an inn or tavern, but possibly with a circus. At the theatre okay. or, or even a noble's court, etc., etc., you receive free lodging and food of a modest or comfortable standard as long as you perform each night. In addition, your performance makes you something of a local figure. When strangers recognize you in the town where you have performed, they typically take a liking to you. So my point is, is I'm trying to barter my uh, my performance skills with the uh, with the innkeeper for. Uh, for food and board. Ah, you have the, um, the, the the special barred feet that allows you to um, stop the, the min- uh, uh, any conversation about resting and just uh, with the performance check and goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I play a bard a lot. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't do the check right now. We'll assume that right now you've you, you've been you've been doing this a little while. Maybe you've even been here before the others arrived. So Pry Pry was already there performing for free room and board and a little, a little bit of uh, att- local attention. And the yep. four of you have a, a kind of trickle in through the door at various times to warm up and get out of the rain, to eat, and find a place to rest if need be. Uh, you, because none of you really know each other, uh, you're all just kind of watching Pry perform, minding your own business. When you notice something, you feel something odd, just for a moment, fall into, I don't know if you have pockets or 
small uh, bags around your waist, somewhere you Krebs can so many in pockets. items local to you, you feel a weight appear in your pocket. Just out of nowhere. Yeah, Krebs has cargo shorts and has more, <laughs> more, more yeah. pocket, more pocket than non-pocket on his trousers. <laughs> He's ninety percent pocket. I thought uh, you were going okay. to say you have a cargo kilt. <laughs> it's just made of pockets. Well, now I do. Oh it's, yes, it's Scotland fantasy cargo <laughs> Scotland. It definitely seems the cargo kilt type. <laughs> oh, that's um, the name. I name my mood board fantasy Scot cargo Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you feel weights suddenly okay. appear in your pocket, and there's no sign of where it came from. No one is around you. No one seems to have reached into you to drop it there. Uh, you just you feel it, and uh, I, I don't want to make assumptions about you, but I uh, I guess you look to see what it is. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I peer into my extremely fashionable bag and of see course, what. Extremely fashionable. It's so fashionable. It draws some eyes as you open it up. <laughs> Checks every pocket, just to make sure nothing else is dropped into any other ones. <laughs> <laughs> one by one, as you each check your pockets, you pull out a small, crumpled letter in uh, a very, a, an envelope of very fine paper uh, with gold and red ink, with a name that is now completely illegible on the front because of the rain has uh, washed away much of it. The, the the envelope is now so soaked through with rain it's almost see through. As you open it, though, it, the letter inside is remarkably dry. The letter has no introduction and no signature, but it has your name at the top. And it says, Come find me. Please, I have urgent need. Of, And then there's, a, there's like a long gap mid-sentence and it stops. And it continues further down the page. And it simply says, Okay, come to me, and there will be handsome rewards, yes. And in the handwriting, which is previously neat up to this point, it kind of trails off into this kind of nonsensical scribble. It's impossible to read, and actually covers the entire bottom third of the letter in this kind of wild scrabbling uh, kind of script. You can only make out the occasional word, and none of it really means anything. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and as you get... And as you get done reading it, you hear a sound outside, a voice yelling, Hey! Come on out! The weird thing is, no one else reacts. And it takes you a moment to realize that only the five of you can hear it. <laughs> Am I still and... playing? <laughs> You're, I mean, you, it's up to you. I mean, would that stop you playing? <laughs> no, no, no. But I think I'll finish the song, take a bow, mage man, with like mage handing my cap with a feather because I, I, I have a hat with Very a good. feather. Very good. So you both, you both, you all hear the voice yelling for you to come outside. No one else reacts or even seems to hear it. Mimosa um, sinks deeper in her seat. Uh, Pride just says thank you. Thank you, everyone. I will be back for an encore soon enough. And I bolt outside. That's... <laughs> Mimosa claps three times, which is commonly accepted among the Kossian high class <laughs> to be an appropriate acknowledgement of an adequate performance by a... <clears throat> but of a lower class of... <laughs> <laughs> um, Krebs, Krebs would like to look down at the letter, look back up and look down at the letter, look towards the voice, and then sneeze because he's allergic to the type of parchment that's written on. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, walk, and then walk outside. <laughs> Pray is already outside. Okay. How does everyone else react? We know we're him and Mosa. Um, how about Graham? What does Graham do with all this? Graham hears the voice. He looks up in confusion and stands up from where he's sitting, grabs his weapon and starts sidling towards the door, mumbling kind of awkward apologies to the people he jostles along the way. <laughs> Just like, like trying to get to your yeah, seat like, the movie oh, theater. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, spill, you know, spill some pea soup. It's like, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Have you made yourself in D&D? <laughs> don't, 
<laughs> Don't we all, though? It doesn't always come back to that. <laughs> it's, uh, I think she's just kind of like stuck in her drink for a bit. Mm-hmm. She doesn't really acknowledge the ending of the music before she just kind of moves up and just rings her drink and she's just so tired of strange voices and now there's another one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, ah, fuck. God damn it. Yeah, let's get this over with. Before she just kind of goes out, not really acknowledging anyone else. Okay. As each of you steps outside, you're greeted by a gnome standing in the mud, soaked through with the rain, looking with nonetheless with a big, bright smile on his face. And he greets each of you individually as you step outside. None of you know who he is. You've never seen him before. But he greets each of you, each of you by name. Graham, Mimosa, Aisla, Pry, and Krebs. I was expecting someone bigger. Yeah, and he kind of he kind of runs, runs up to you and shakes each of your hands in turn. And says, okay, fantastic, I'm glad you're here. Right, I have some amazing news. Right, are you ready? Can we do this Just gotta go down the rest of my dink. Oh, no, 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 we have to do it here. There's too many people in there. It's too busy. I don't, I don't like those crowded spaces. Okay, but... You are paying for my laundry. Fine, 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 fine. You know, you know I'm good for it. Krebs replies in really, in really, really poor spoken Sylvan. A wee, 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 monsieur. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> So he kind of nods and says, yes, perfect, excellent. As, as he's done shaking each of your hands in turn, he kind of takes a step back and says, it's time for all of you to get together and finally save this world. Hearing this, just, Pry gets the biggest, like, slow motion mouth uh, transition to a <laughs> grin ever. Like, like, you, you just know, like it's the <laughs> slow dawning realization into, yes, this is so cool. Krebs looks at um, looks at Pry, looks at the gnome, looks back to Pry, looks at the gnome, goes, "Excuse moi <laughs> <laughs> And we're gonna stop there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna call it here. We're gonna pick up from here when we play the actual game. Okay. So yeah, if we want to go through everyone one more time, if you have anything you want to plug, now's the time to do it. Uh, so I'm Martin Bryson, again, uh, I do this. I also do the Indie Haven podcast with uh, Josh and Josh Rivers and Elodie Cunningham. We do, it's mostly about uh, indie games news and opinions and we do funny jokes from time to time, at least we think they are. Well, you can find me on Twitter, I almost forgot to mention, you could find me on Twitter at, uh, at is this Martin. that's Martin with a Y, by the way. Uh, how about you, Martin, you get anything you want to you wanna plug? Oh yeah, you can find me on Twitter at, at MDTigerHam. Okay. Uh, anyone else wanna wanna do anything? I'm Heath. I have been known to do a lot of politics, thoughts, and Star Wars opinions, with most of which go on Facebook, which you can search for if you feel like subjecting yourself to it. But you can also find me on Twitter at the Angry Ace. Uh, anyone else? Want- I I have a Twitter where where I retweet angry leftist and queer rants and also pornography at Maddie Dewar. <laughs> Amelia and Helen, do you have anything you want to uh, talk about? I ain't got shit. <laughs> okay. I kindly invite you to leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. That's also an option. Uh, okay. And this is uh, the, the introductory episode for The Haven. That's the in, an, indie, an indie haven podcast, an actual play D&D podcast. And uh, we'll hope to join, we'll hope you'll join us for the first episode soon. Bye. Yay. Bye. 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 See ya. Thank you all so much for listening. Music for today's episode comes from Rebecca E. Tripp, Garpocalypse, and Dark Flame Wolf at ocremix.com, Kevin McLeod at incompetech.filmmusic.io, and Indie Haven's very own Elodie Cunningham at chemicalwordsmith.bandcamp.com. Track listing and attributions information can be found in the description below. See you next time. Thanks for listening to Podhaven.